Hello everyone. So for this topic, I will have the COVID-19 biomarkers. So let's have first the overview. So I think this is well known to us already. I hope so. So the first reported case of COVID-19 was in Wuhan, China, and that was on December 2019. And then the World Health Organization on February 11, 2020, officially named this infection as Coronavirus Disease 2019 or COVID-19. Again, that is referring to the infection itself. And as for the virus, it was named as SARS-CoV-2. And also, on March 11, 2020, this COVID-19 infection was declared as a pandemic. And also, in the Philippines, we have this presidential proclamation number 922 series of 2020. So this was issued declaring a state of public health emergency throughout the Philippines during that time because of this COVID-19 infection. And the code alert system for COVID-19 was raised that time to code red sub-level 2. And that is also in accordance with the recommendation of the Department of Health and also the IATF. So for COVID-19 infection, we have here a short um, description. So it is a multi-system disease. So that means it is not only a localized respiratory infection, right? So it could involve your immunological processes, inflammatory processes, and even coagulative processes of the body. That's why it was named as, or it is designated as a multi-system disease. And this one could also infect both the adults and the children. So in adults, the virus can typically cause pneumonia and acute respiratory distress syndrome. And again, multi-system disease. And then another one for children, so they are mostly asymptomatic or they might have mild to moderate illness. And we have this term, the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children or the MISC. So this one, the children with this kind of infection are sicker and they may have um, multi-organ dysfunction and they may require intensive care. So as what you can see in the illustration, the COVID-19 virus is spheroidal in shape. So coronaviruses are spheroidal and also they are single-stranded RNA viruses. So how about for the transmission? How do we acquire this one? So we can acquire them through exposure to micro droplets from infected individuals or by contact transmission through contaminated fomites. That's why we are always told to wear our gloves, to wash our hands, and also to wear our mask. And also another thing, when this virion enters the body, it will reach the smaller airways of the lungs and also it will reach the alveoli and specifically it will target the epithelial cells of the bronchus and the alveolar. That's why COVID-19 is a um, respiratory infection. But again, as what I have mentioned, it is not localized to respiratory problems because it is a multi-system disease. Okay? And another one, what we have to take note here is the spike glycoprotein or the S-protein. So the spike surface glycoprotein is found on the surface of the virus and it binds this one. So it binds the angiotensin converting enzyme 2. So I hope you still remember the function of the enzyme. Okay, so just a review. In the presence of this one, renin, this angiotensinogen, so this angiotensinogen will be converted to angiotensin 1. I hope you still remember this. And of course, this angiotensin 1 will be converted to angiotensin 2. Again, by what enzyme? Okay, by ACE. So that's produced from our lungs. And also, you have to take note that this ACE can be expressed by the organs and cells of the body. So like for example, we can find it in the distal airways, also in the alveoli, and also the alveolar macrophages and the dendritic cells, they also express this ACE. And specifically our pneumocytes. So our pneumocytes have the highest expression of ACE2 enzyme. So aside from those areas, we can also um, find ACE 
in the nasopharyngeal area, in the oropharyngeal epithelia, in the nasal and oral epithelia. So that is the reason why um, one of the processes that we do in the collection of the sample is we get the sample from the nasopharyngeal area of the, of the patient because of this one. Okay, because this is again is found on those area and cells of the body. Okay, another thing, once the virus enters the body, as what I have mentioned, it will target the epithelial cells of the alveoli, right? Alveoli. Okay, so the alveolar epithelial cells will be targeted, the lymphocytes also, and also the vascular endothelial cells will be targeted. So those are the primary targets of the virions. But aside from that, this virus will also inhibit the production of this substance. Remember this one, the interferon? So this interferon, by the name itself, it interferes with the virus. So that means it prevents them from multiplying. But the virus will inhibit this interferon. Okay? So what will happen if this interferon is inhibited? There will be viral replication. So there will be a, um, a release of large number of virions that could lead to infection of the neighboring target cells and of course, viremia. So the viruses are now found in our blood. And that now could cause exaggerated pulmonary and systemic inflammatory responses. And that also is the reason why COVID-19 patients usually um, have ARDS or, again, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Also, they have shock and coagulopathy. Okay, so next one. This illustrates the normal function of ACE. So take note, this ACE basically will um, hydrolyze this angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2 which then acts on angiotensin 1 receptors. So this could cause vasoconstriction. Again, that's the normal function of ACE, leading to vasoconstriction. And aside from that, the ACE is also required in the hydrolysis of bradykinin. Okay, remember, this bradykinin is a major functional vasodilator. So when this is present, it could dilate the arterioles, and aside from that, it could also cause inflammation. So this bradykinin in the presence of ACE can be hydrolyzed to bradykinin 1,7 to bradykinin 1,5 so that vasodilation will be prevented. Again, normal function of ACE. How about this one? What is the effect if there is ACE dysfunction? Like for example, in COVID-19, so there is um, dysfunction in ACE because of endothelial damage or because of ARDS or septic shock, for example. So those conditions will now prevent this angiotensin 1 to be converted to angiotensin 2. Okay, so this one has dysfunction. So what is the result? The angiotensin 1 will increase. So there will be an accumulation of angiotensin 1 and that excess angiotensin 1 will be metabolized to angiotensin 1,9 and angiotensin 1,7. So that now leads to the production of nitric oxide, also the B2 receptor, the mass receptor, and AT2 receptor, all of which will lead to vasodilation as opposed to the normal mechanism of ACE that could lead to vasoconstriction. Okay, so they will result to vasodilation. Another one, bradykinins. So again, this is a potent vasodilator, right? So without ACE, so without ACE here, this bradykinin will not be converted to bradykinin 1,7 and eventually it will not be converted to bradykinin 1,5. So because of this accumulation of Bradykinin can be seen, so that could also lead to vasodilation and also inflammation. I hope you understand this one. Okay, so for the test that detects the COVID-19, so number one, we have the PCR. So the diagnosis of COVID-19 is confirmed by direct detection of the virus, the SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acids in the respiratory tract specimen 
with this test. Okay, commonly we call it RT-PCR. And then another one, we have the rapid antigen test. And now I will focus in here, the biomarkers. So what are biomarkers or what is a biomarker? So a biomarker is a characteristic that can be objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of normal biological and pathological processes or pharmacological responses to a therapeutic intervention. So how about the uses of biomarkers in COVID-19? So number one, we have the early suspicion of disease. Next, confirmation and classification of disease severity. Framing hospital admission criteria. Identification of high-risk cohort. Rationalizing therapies. Assessing response to therapies. Predicting outcome. Framing ICU admission criteria and also ICU discharge criteria. So later you will know this as we go along to the specific biomarkers. And I have here the summary of the COVID-19 biomarkers. So one of the biomarkers that is decreased in COVID-19 patient is the hemoglobin. So this one um, is commonly observed in COVID-19 patients. And aside from that, the anemia and altered iron homeostasis were also common in hospitalized COVID-19 patients. And in particular, this anemia has been associated with increased COVID-19 mortality. And another thing, the higher ferritin to transferrin ratios, I will elaborate this later, but this test could predict the need for ICU admission and mechanical ventilation. Another one, we have the lymphocytes. So I think I have also mentioned this earlier that once the COVID enters the body, one of the primary targets of the virus is the lymphocytes, right? Because this lymphocyte expresses the ACE2 in their surface. So that, that now would lead to decreased lymphocyte because of the direct viral invasion and lysis as lymphocytes express the ACE2 receptors on their surfaces. Another thing, we have apoptosis of lymphocytes induced by interleukins and also reduced lymphocytes turnover due to cytokine storm induced atrophy of lymphoid organs. I don't know if you have heard this one, cytokine storm. But anyway, cytokines are produced by the cells of our innate immune response, right? So these cytokines, once they are overly produced, it could lead to organ damage because this cytokine storm can lead to the production of pro-inflammatory substances such as the interleukin-6, the tumor necrosis factor, and that now, again, could damage our organs. And one of the reasons also for this one is um, this cytokine storm, again, could lead to lymphopenia. Another one, reduced lymphocyte proliferation due to lactic acidosis, and we define lymphopenia if the lymphocyte count is less than 1,100 cells per microliter. Another hematological biomarker is the neutrophil. So as stated in here, patients requiring admission to the ICU had a higher percentage and absolute number of neutrophil. So that means both the relative count and the absolute neutrophil counts are increased. Okay, so you have to take note that these neutrophils are innate immune cells and they have a short lifespan. However, they are also um, the leading players in the innate immunity because they are uh, among the first innate leukocytes recruited during the infections. And one of the primary functions of neutrophil, neutrophil is the clearance of pathogens and debris through phagocytosis. So that's why as what you can see here in the illustration, they have this um, the apidesis mechanism, okay? And also, um, as what you can see here in the illustration, there is a formation of nets. So these neutrophils can develop a sophisticated network of DNA. So again, we call it as nets, okay? That is neutrophil extracellular traps. So they are characterized again as extracellular DNA fibers comprised of histone and cytoplasmic granule proteins. So in short, they are like um, innate responses against pathogen invasion. 
So they could capture the pathogen and also degrade or kill the pathogen. So that is also the reason why in COVID-19, we can see increased neutrophils because of these mechanisms, phagocytosis and NETS production. Next biomarker is the platelet. So in COVID-19 patients, platelet count differs between mild and serious infections. So the patients with mild symptoms have a slightly increased platelet count, whereas thrombocytopenia or decreased platelet count is a hallmark of a severe COVID-19 infection. So this COVID-19 infection may increase the levels of autoantibodies and immune complexes which could eventually lead to the specific destruction of the platelets by our immune system. And also, um, the antibodies and immune complexes deposited on the surfaces of platelets will be recognized by the reticuloendothelial cells and the platelets also will be destroyed. So they're like a target tissue being destroyed by these reticuloendothelial cells. And that now could lead to excessive platelet destruction. And aside from that, the antibodies produced during viral infection may also bind to the antigens on the platelets, like it's a molecular mimicry. So this one can also result to platelet destruction. And another one in COVID-19, there is lung infection. So the viral infection because of COVID-19 could result to inflammation. And that could also result to lung damage, right? And the damaged lung tissues and pulmonary endothelial cells may activate platelets in the lungs. So that now will result in the aggregation and the formation of microthrombi. So what will happen? So there will be an increased platelet consumption. So that's why we can see thrombocytopenia in severe COVID cases. So for our hematological parameters, we have here number one, the NLP score of greater than 6 could mean progression to severe disease. So this NLP means neutrophil, lymphocyte, and platelet count. Okay, so if greater than 6, that means the disease progression, uh, I mean the disease is progressing to severe cases. Next one, increase NLR. So this NLR, that is neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. So this is a prognostic marker for predicting poor outcomes. Next, low LCR. So this LCR, that is lymphocyte to CRP ratio. So this can predict, um, predict ICU admission and the need for invasive ventilation. Okay, so in short, if we can see increased NLR and low LCR, that could correlate now with the severity of COVID-19 infections. Next, we have the cytokines. So as what I have mentioned earlier, these are substances released by our innate cells like the macrophages, also the natural killer cells. So these are proteins which are released by those cells and they have a specific effect on the interaction and communication between cells. So again, the aggravated production of this cytokine can lead to a cytokine storm which could eventually lead to the production of pro-inflammatory substances such as this interleukin-6 and that could also lead to organ damage, particularly in the lungs. So more than half of the admitted patients were found to have elevated levels of interleukin-6. And this is an important marker of disease severity and predictor of mortality. And this could also monitor the therapeutic response to COVID-19. So you have here the other pro-inflammatory cytokines produced. And to understand better what is this cytokine storm, I want you to watch this video. The immune system has an impressive ability to respond to various pathogens. Normal antiviral immune response requires the activation of the inflammatory pathways of the immune system. Cytokines are produced by immune cells that are part of the innate immune response, including macrophages, dendritic cells, natural killer cells, and the adaptive T and B lymphocytes. An unchecked and over-exuberant immune response, known as a cytokine storm, can lead to irreversible tissue damage. This has been recognized in severe and critical COVID-19 patients. 
The cytokine storm results from a sudden acute increase in circulating levels of different pro-inflammatory cytokines, including IL-6, IL-1, TNF-alpha, and interferon, which has destructive effects on human tissue. Cytokine storm may cause acute respiratory distress syndrome and is the major cause of death in COVID-19 patients. Elevated levels of IL-6 may be an early indicator that a patient is at risk of cytokine storm and acute respiratory distress. Measuring IL-6 levels may help assess disease progression and help physicians develop treatment plans. Next, we have the CRP and procalcitonin. So both of them are predictors of poor outcomes. So the cutoff for CRP is greater than 10 milligrams per liter and for procalcitonin is greater than 0.5 nanograms per ml and we have here the level 26 milligrams per liter so this could serve as a cutoff to predict progression to severe COVID-19 disease so that's for their level anyway um, again the CRP here is increased right so the elevated levels of CRP might be because of the overproduction of the inflammatory cytokines as discussed earlier, especially in patients with COVID-19. And also, the elevated CRP can be induced by tissue destruction in patients with COVID-19. And another thing, this elevated CRP may be a valuable early marker. So again, early marker to predict the progression of disease. Like we could tell that maybe these non-severe patients could develop severe COVID-19. So by that level of CRP, it could also help the health workers to identify those patients at an early stage also for early treatment. Okay, another thing, we have the procalcitonin. So I hope you still remember this one. So this is in clinical chemistry topic. So the PCT or procalcitonin is a 116 amino acid precursor of the hormone calcitonin. So where is the production site of your calcitonin? So your calcitonin lowers the calcium and it is produced from the thyroid parafollicular cells. So take note that this procalcitonin is a widely used biomarker for bacterial infection. So that means this is usually utilized as a biomarker again for bacterial infection. But why is it that we are testing this in COVID-19 patients? Because normally, um, the PCT levels in the physiological state of our serum is below 0.05 nanograms per ml. So that's below 0.05 nanograms per ml. So normal physiologic state. But as what you can see here in COVID-19, it could be greater than 0.5 nanograms per ml. So meaning to say this PCT may be a valuable tool in identifying COVID-19 patients who may be at risk for bacterial co-infection because as what I have mentioned again, this is used as a biomarker for bacterial infection, right? So like for example, in the case of a microbial infection, the PCT levels can significantly increase as it is released by the parenchymal tissue under the influence of endotoxins and also of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Okay, so you also have to take note of this one because this was mentioned in several existing studies. Um, usually, the patients at an early stage of COVID-19 or let's say upon admission, their PCT levels are low. Like for example, it's less than 0.1 micrograms per liter. That's at the time of admission. However, despite of the low PCT, we can still say that there is um, inflammation in the lungs because some um, biomarkers for inflama inflammation, such as the WBCs and C-reactive protein during admission, are already increased. But then again, the PCT is still decreased. However, as the disease progresses and at a certain point, okay, the, the PCT levels will try, uh, will, I mean, will start to increase. Okay? So one of the reasons um, for that is the patient might have acquired bacterial co-infection. And this is very common in patients with a viral infection because once the lung tissue gets, uh, gets damaged, 
by the virus, it is easier for the normal bacterial flora to gain access and become invasive. So that now could result to the development of secondary bacterial pneumonia in these COVID-19 patients. That's why the PCT is increased. Okay, another reason may be the patient is already deteriorating. I mean, the, the disease already progresses to severe um, infection. So that's the use of CRP and procalcitonin. Next, we have the ferritin. So this ferritin is a representative of total body iron stores, right? So aside from that, this is also considered as a positive acute phase reactant, meaning to say their concentrations increase during inflammation. Because when we say negative acute phase reactant, their concentrations decrease during inflammation. So this one is a positive acute phase reactant. And also, its prognostic utility is linked with COVID-19. So meaning to say, it can predict the mortality of COVID-19 cases. So also, it could predict ICU admission and need for ventilation. And again, it could predict severe disease and mortality. So as what you can see also here, um, in non-severe cases, this is the value of ferritin, whereas hyperferritinemia can be observed in patients with severe COVID-19 disease. Again, because this is a positive acute phase reactance, and in COVID-19, there is inflammation. So it is given that this ferritin will also increase during COVID-19. Next one, we have the serum albumin. So this albumin, this is a protein. So as opposed to your ferritin, this is a negative acute phase protein. So what will be the level of albumin during COVID-19, during inflammation? So this is decreased because again, this is a negative acute phase protein. So I hope you still remember the roles of your albumin. So it maintains the osmotic pressure also the vascular permeability, and also it could transport various compounds. So um, decrease in albumin can be observed in critically ill COVID-19 patients. And the COVID-19 um, patients could have a serum albumin of less than 35 grams per liter. And this is independently um, this independently increases the risk of death in COVID-19 by at least sixfold the decrease in albumin okay and also um hypoalbuminemia is um attributed to uh, to inflammation so because this inflammation has been shown to cause the escape of serum albumin into the interstitial space because of the increased capillary permeability so that means the serum albumin will decrease, whereas there will be an increased volume distribution of albumin in the interstitial spaces. Next one and last one, we have the LDH. So this LDH is an intracellular enzyme. So it is mostly found in all, almost all cells or all organ systems of the body. Okay. So this elevated LDH has been associated with a higher risk of ARDS and the need for intensive care and mortality. And also elevated LDH values were associated with six-fold increased odds of severe COVID-19 disease. And also it is associated with a 16-fold increase in the odds of mortality. So a lot of studies tell us that this LDH is a predictor of worse outcomes, especially in hospitalized patients. So, those are the things that are important, I think. So, thank you so much for listening.